So we're going to get started. Um, my name is Marco Hansen. This is my lovely bride, Margaret, <laughs> who is actually the owner of Texan Translation. She's also my boss. Um, and so it's a big deal that she's here with us today. She's very busy, very important person. Um, but we're doing marriage certificates. And so um, she's the ideal partner to help me explain <laughs> how to translate a marriage certificate. We're going to do marriage and divorce. Turns out that First of all, it just it is a bad vibe, you know, translating a divorce certificate with your wife. But um, the divorce certificates are so much longer than the marriage that I don't think we're going to be able to fit it all into the hour. So we'll probably just do marriage today and save divorce for another day. And the marriage that we're the marriage certificate that we're doing is kind of a long one, and so we're going to yeah go through it as quick as we can. But so we got a couple of comments in Facebook on the the ad for this. Do you want to address um, uh, the Photoshopping of the original. Oh yeah, so every time we do this, every every webinar that we're doing, we are taking a, a original um, a screen a screenshot of an original marriage certificate, birth certificate, whatever it is that we're doing. Um, but then Marco painstakingly takes time to Photoshop out the names and places and and you know personal information, birth dates and all that stuff, and just change them out with with made up names, with, with, you know, just useless information. So this is not a marriage certificate of real people. None of these people, I mean, there's probably somebody named Jesus Espinosa Escobedo somewhere in the world, but he was not necessarily born in Zacatecas yeah. on this date. He was not married on this date to this person. This is all made up and it's all so that, so <laughs> fear not, we are not handing out people's personal right. information for you to steal their identities. And, and somebody always complains about that because they don't read the fine print. And so we just want to get that out there first of all. First thing, this is, these are not real people. So here's the generic uh, cover sheet that we use. I mean, ours has our letterhead on it, but this is one that you could uh, model your certification statement out after. Um, because it's going to be used for immigration purposes, it doesn't need to be notarized. This, in this particular case, certain clients would want it to be notarized, so I'm going to delete that. And then we like to have the cover sheet with the certification statement. And then the, the second page will be a screen capture of the document. And then on the third and fourth page, we'll do the translation. Now, we put the, um, the image of the document just for reference so that people can say, oh, yeah, this is the same one. But it does not replace the, doc the original document that they're supposed to submit, for example, for immigration. They are supposed to submit their original document or a copy of it along with the translation. And this does not substitute for that. Ours is too small to read clearly. It's just meant for a reference so they can compare and go, OK, this is a translation of this, and that matches this. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so here we have the, uh, for the purposes of uh, readability here on your screens, if you're using a smaller screen, I'm going to set the view to split. And then we can have over under on the top. We'll have the source document on the bottom. I'll be typing the translation. And um, somebody also said in the Facebook comments, uh, don't forget, you have to be certified to do these legally in the US. Could you address that concern? <laughs> Okay, so no. there is no government government body that certifies translators. Um, it, it's not like a doctor has to appear before the the medical board and pass a test and receive their their credentials to be able to practice medicine in the United States. You do not have to have a particular credential to be able to translate in the United States. In order to certify a translation, you have to write a certification statement that says something along the lines of I. Margaret Hansen, am fluent in Spanish and English, and am qualified to translate this document. The translation that appears below is accurate to the best of my ability, and accurate and complete uh, to the best of my ability, and include some contact information, um, and, and so that so that if there's a question about the translation, they can they can find you. Um, but but there is not a government body that certifies translators in in the U.S. Um, there are private groups like the American Translators Association, but they but they are private organizations. They are not like a, a licensing body like the the GBCC or or the um, what's the licensing and registration TDLR? Yeah, no, Texas Department one. of Licensing and Registration. No. So there's not something like that in the U.S. Thank and, you. So. Cierto. Así es. 
Um, so anybody who's on this call is probably as is can probably I mean I don't know all of you, but you're probably qualified to legally produce certified translations in the U.S. If you're over 18 and you can honestly sign a certification statement saying that it's a complete and accurate translation. Um, and for a job like this, we would charge fifty dollars if it, we were going to send it out as a PDF afterwards. Um, Seventy dollars if it were notarized hard copy that we're going to mail out, just so you can get an idea. That's that's a pretty standard uh, price in the current market for certified translations here. So, go ahead. I was just going to say, so so I see that Marco's got some bracketed information there, and so we put in brackets, square brackets, information that's not written text on a document, but that's Love. identifiable information so he, he made note that there was a decorative border around the page you don't have to do that we, we like to throw that in again as I, identifying this is the same document that you're looking at um, a, there's a watermark in the center background with the seal of Mexico um, which you can't see on the screen right now but um, when we scroll a little bit later you'll be able to see that again but then there is text it says United Mexican States or it says it says Estados Unidos Mexicanos United Mexican States. And so that is outside of the brackets because that's actual written text. But little things like the seal of Mexico, the coat of arms on the right, get mentioned because they are on the document. They exist there, so we mention them. They have text on them. We have to include that text. Even if we know this doesn't have anything to do with you know, the, the, the important stuff, our job is not to decide what is the important stuff. Our job is to translate everything. And it's USCIS's job to decide what's important. So we, we make sure that everything that's on the page is at least mentioned so they know they have an idea of what it is. I see us. Doing a great job with that table. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I've been practicing. So I like to um, take all abbreviations, even common abbreviations in both languages, like NO period for number. I like to spell those out just so there's no confusion over what abbreviations and acronyms might mean. Um, date of registration or date of registry, either one is fine. I'm not going to lie. If the space is really tiny that I have to work with, I will put NO period. <gasps> yeah, because sometimes I'm doing like transcripts and okay. the columns are so narrow. Yeah. Just, you know, yeah. Okay. It happens. Okay, fine. Be like that. Um, three, I'm going to join. So when you have uh, cells that are joined together, you select all of them and then right click on it and choose merge cells and that makes one long cell out of it. For localidad, we've uh, used different English versions. Um, locality, uh, place. Um, I'm going to put locality. I don't think there's a... I'm busy right now. I have, I have a session. I think there's a, an exact equivalent of a lot of these terms in English. Zacatecas, but locality is a word, and it reminds me of localidad. Um, 24, no, um, 14 no. Yeah. February. No, the oh. mes año. So okay. Get the month year. Day, month, year, February 14, 2000. No, no. Yes, 20. no, no, you're right. Okay. You know, you could just put the numbers just like they've got them because it tells you day, month, year. Let's do that. And that doesn't make sense. No, you did that wrong. When you photoshopped that, you must have done that wrong because the, there's no 14th month. Okay, you're right. See, I should have had you helping me photoshop it too. Yeah. But we know that it's supposed to be February 14th. Um, so I'm going to fix that this was our mistake. Run. That yeah, was our yeah, mistake. Yeah. No, okay. That's not originally on the document. We I know. just wanted to, I wanted to prove that the document had been photoshopped, so I purposely inserted that in there. Very clever. <laughs> Yeah, wow. Okay, merge cells. Municipio, uh, we usually use municipality. Um, Zacatecas. Entidad federativa. This is this always gives us trouble because there's no equivalent in English. But um, it's like a state. In almost every case, it's a state, except in the case of um, it, okay. Mexico. Right. And so you can say federal entity. That's fine. Um, but I've taken to using state because... Because it's commonly understood in English in the United States. Yeah, and and think about your audience. Who's going to be receiving this, and how can you make it as clear as possible for them? And if this is going to USCIS, the immigration officer just wants to know what what that word means. What is Zacatecas? Is that a thing? Is that a you know what is what is, is a Zacatecas? Name? Yeah. Is that and a food? So, right. And so you just need to make it clear that's just where they're from. Okay, so I'm turning up the border for the outside 
table, but I'm leaving it on for the inside so it looks like um, the top there. And now I'm going uh, back out of the table into the main body of the document. And it used to say um, nombre del contrayente and nombre de la contrayente for the, the groom and the bride. And the newer ones say contrayente uno and contrayente dos in case it's a same sex couple. And so we like to use name of spouse one and then name of spouse two. Hector Espinosa. You want to comment on the spelling of Espinosa? Oh, yeah. So, um, Z's and S's, huh? How about those Z's and S's? In Spanish, same sound, right? And so when you are coming across a name, Espinosa can be spelled with a Z or an S. And a lot of names have both of those. I've seen Montes with a Z or an S. Um, lots of them. I'm not going to list all the ones I've seen. But it's real easy to, in your head, sort of always spell that name the same way because it sounds the same in your head. And so Espinosa always sounds the same, whether it's spelled with a Z or an S. And so when you're typing it, your brain is going to just spell it the way it wants, the, the way you picture it in your head. And so when you have names that are, you just want to be real careful with things, making sure that, that it's spelled, actually the way it's spelled on the document and not just the way you spell it in your head. And, be careful. And a, a recurring pitfall is... Um, Recycling an old one you had, like a year ago, you did the same kind of document for a different client, and then just reusing that, which saves you time, but then leaving some little piece of information from the old one. Um, state, federal, okay, I'm just yeah, checking. They're just agreeing with us. I think okay. we're in record, record or entry, or entry number. number. Yeah. yeah. Do you mention I the decorative board around the certificate? Number. Yes. Um, decorative green border surrounds the page. Yeah. yeah. I don't think, I wouldn't say you have to mention the border, no, but they wouldn't get because there's no that. text involved yeah. in that. And so they're not going to look at it and go, well, why didn't they tell me what this green border means? You know, but if it has words, any words at all, you've got to translate it because the, the non source language speaker is looking at that going saying the, the thing in themselves, does that say this is invalid unless it has this special thing, which this document doesn't have? They don't know. And and one way that I remind myself of that, because if you're looking at a document in a language that you speak, it's really easy to say, well, everybody knows what that says. Everybody understands that this is what's going on here. Obviously. Imagine that you are reading it in a language that you don't know. In uh, an in, alphabet, in you, alphabet don't know. you don't know. That it's Japanese, that it's Arabic, that it's Russian, and you have no idea what those, those symbols mean. And if you saw that, what would you be thinking? Does that say you have to have the red seal, and if there's no red seal, then the whole document is useless? Or does it say void unless there's a, you know, what, I don't know. You just need to make oh, it Oh, like that one from thing. Kyrgyzstan that was void if it wasn't sewn together with thread or something? Oh, was that Kyrgyzstan? Uh, it was, no, Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, sorry, sorry. It was going Kazakhs. to Kazakhstan. Yeah. And it had, we had to... Uh, it was arts and crafts here. We just we were sewing things and stamping things and <laughs> stickering things and fingerprints. Yeah. Okay, so for domicilio, I usually use address in contracts. Sometimes I use domicile because the the word domicile is a legal term meaning like where the the business is registered. But for people, I use address because you never I would I never say in in English I'm domiciled personally in Austin. Awesome. <laughs> That's just awkward. Um, so I got that case. Remember, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, that translation is an art, not a science, and there's more than one correct way to translate anything, and you have to develop your own sense of judgment based on your knowledge of your native language to choose the term that you feel is most appropriate for that context. And, and that it's best to translate into your native language and not into a second language. It's possible, I'm not saying you can't, but it's preferable that you translate into your native language because of that native feel, that vibe that you you can offer and the authenticity that you can lend to the translation that way. I'm just listening to you and typing what you're saying instead of what it says on here. <laughs> okay. Nombre de la calle y número exterior e interior. We don't talk about interior and exterior numbers here. We'd say like building number and apartment number or something. Yeah. Um, and I think I, depending on the document, I think I've translated that as um, how, what did I, there was a document and it just didn't make any sense to translate it like this. I want to say that I used, yeah, building in unit, unit numbers, maybe, or house number and, okay. I don't remember. 
So I see here that we have the um, same row of information again that we just had up above. So I would recommend just going up there and with your mouse, control C, copying it, bring it down here and pasting it. And then doing that again for the labels underneath that. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to make this as pretty as I want to make it, like with the bold print and the smaller font for the labels underneath. I'm just going to be focusing on the words, but you can go back and try to match the formatting a little more if that's important to you. And I do like to do that. I like to, if, if they have it bold, I will make it bold. If they use a smaller font, I'll use a little bit smaller font. There are limits. I, I almost never will go over 16 point font and never under eight point font unless I'm really desperate for some reason. But, um, but it just gets, it just gets awkward and, you know, I, I'm, my job isn't to do graphic design and make it all, I'm not recreating the whole certificate. I am just giving you the information that you need. In spouse two. Okay, so um, for spouse one, we finished that block, and now for spouse two, it, everything is arranged the same. So I've just selected it, copied it, and pasted it below. Um, now I'm going to go through and change the names for, in this case, the wife. But remember, anytime you're cutting and pasting, you have to uh, be careful to actually change everything and not leave some of the information from the source paragraphs. Cisneros Gomez. So what if um, she tell, what if Amanda Cisneros is the one who orders this and she's like, oh, they put Gomez with a Z on my certificate, but it's actually Gomez with an S. Can you fix it? What do we say? <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We do not change the information we only translate the information and if if there is a problem with the original document then they need to fix the original document with whoever issued it um, in fact our daughter has a, an error on her birth certificate my name is they, they put my married name instead of my maiden name on the certificate but if i take that to a translator i can't just say hey can you put my maiden name on here no, they can't. They can only put what is written on the document, and we can only do that. And I've had people say, oh, but they misspelled it. This is the way it's really spelled. And I'm like, hey, cool. But <laughs> I'm going to misspell it, and I'm going to put sick. Are you familiar with the Latin? I don't remember what the whole phrase is, but you put in brackets S-I-C, and it's a Latin term that basically means there's a mistake here, and I'm just copying the mistake. Yeah. And that's, that's don't, all you can Don't do. shoot the messenger. Right. Don't shoot the translator. So here we have Av Melchor Melchor Ocampo S.A.N. And if you're from Mexico, you, you know that means Avenida and C Numero, but it means nothing to the reader in the U.S. who isn't familiar with that, um, with that um, convention. And so as a translator, I would recommend spelling it all out. Avenida Melchor Ocampo. And if you want, if you could put Avenida in brackets. Um, you could also put um, the translation of sin numero, like uh, no number in brackets if you wanted to in English. But since it's addressed, nobody really cares what the address is. They just, um, once in a while, if it's an odd address that doesn't, uh, we think isn't going to make sense to the recipient, we'll put address in brackets and then we'll just leave the address in the source language and retype it. Um, because it doesn't matter that that means avenue and that means no number in the context of this transaction. This is, if you study translation theory, um, they talk about a, a spectrum from documental translations to instrumental translations. Documental translations are when the source document, a uh, cultural transaction needs to be preserved as much as possible. And so those are super precise and faithful to the original, while instrumental um, translations are ones where um, what's being done with the translation in the target culture is what's important, and that's when it has to make sense to people receiving the target culture. And in a case like this, what's most important uh, from the translator's philosophical perspective is that my client is able to um, conduct some legal business in the United States using this translation, like remarry, for example, or I don't know, maybe they're filing for child support. And so I have to make sure that the recipient in the target culture is able to extract the useful information out of the translation without changing anything or being inaccurate. So address, um, let's see, down here we have Zacatecas, Zacatecas, Zacatecas. So that's the same for both of them, okay. Uh, next we have the parents of spouse one. 
kind of don't put the fathers, even though padres also means fathers. Here, I'm pretty sure it means parents. Parents of spouse one. And name of the father. Jesus Espinosa. And here I imagine that eventually we will see birth certificates or marriage certificates or whatnot that say nombre del padre uno y nombre del padre dos. Yeah. Or something along those lines. Right. In another generation. Right. And parent one and parent two because this past, back, back when this person was married, it was a mother and father, but more and more there will be two mothers or two fathers on the certificates. So here's a question we sometimes get, Margaret. I see like there's a space for a domicilio of the father, but then there's no information. Can we just leave off the word domicilio? Oh, no. It's blank, though. I mean, no. why put that? Because it's written there. Okay. Everything that's written. Um, name of the father, yes. Um, yes, absolutely. Fa father apostrophe S name would actually be better. Yeah. Now, thanks for bringing that up, Manuela. Yeah. That's what I would have done, Manuela. I don't like name of the father. It sounds like translation ease. And along the same vein, I think you bring that up because along the same vein, sometimes it'll say um, nombres y apellidos, and that's that translates awkwardly into English. Do you say names and, and surnames, or given names and surnames, or, or first names and last names? I usually just say full name yeah. because I feel like that conveys more concisely what they're asking for. What are you going to do with Ma Cristina Juarez? Okay, in this situation, I would put M-A bracket R-I-A, close bracket, because I know that that means Maria Cristina. There's no doubt in my mind that M-A Cristina Juarez is, is going to be Maria Cristina. But it doesn't say that explicitly on the document. So I put the bracket around there to indicate that the translator is adding information there for clarity that's not explicitly stated. That's why. I have yeah. That. And I sometimes do that. Sometimes I'll just put it in Maria. I'll, I'll treat it like an abbreviation. Okay. Like I did for Av. For Av, I put Avenida. For Ma, I put Maria. But, but one time we had somebody come back and tell us, I don't remember what country they sent it to, but someone rejected it because they looked at the original and said, it says Ma on the original. It doesn't say Maria. You can't put Maria. You don't know that's Maria. And they sent it back. And so after that, really? we, started, we started, I don't think it's in the oh, U.S., but we I started using the, the square brackets. Yeah. Okay. That's funny. Like, what else could it possibly be? Yeah, of course it's Maria. <laughs> It doesn't mean it was your ma. Ma name is Christina. <laughs> good guess, good guess, but no. Um, occupation. Okay, I think I'm missing uh, somebody's occupation. Well, here. there's not one here. After domicilio on the father. Yeah, there's not. There are no occupations listed on parent one or parent of spouse one. Parents of spouse one occupation occupation. It's blank, but the word is. There. Oh, you need it twice. Yeah, Under yeah. nationality. So that's so in the it's, same, it's in the same line, line as, as domicilio. Yeah, so that needs to go up a line. Okay. So I'll put this up here like this. Space it over, más o menos, like it is in the original. So you do you not have a table here? I don't. I didn't step to make a table. Oh. I'm sorry. Oh. Ooh. I know. You would always make a table. I but, would make a table. But so we, do things, we do things differently, and that's okay. Oh, well. Okay. I'll make sure that ma is as on the document. Sometimes it has a period, sometimes not. Okay. Yes, true. Um, I think though, in, in in case of a name, I would leave out the period if I'm putting if I'm putting the bracketed information, because I think that would be more confusing than less. And again, we're trying to make this as clear to the end user what's happening. Um, and so putting ma period bracket ria bracket. I think would add confusion rather than alleviate it. Yeah, and, and remember the your your judgment is important, and your judgment will evolve as time goes by, and you work on on more of these. And right. the um, if you if you study translation in school, um, there are s some schools of thought that have set very particular rules. Like this is this is the law of translation. You always have to do it that way. But um, I think it's more important to consider the context, the, the source context and the target context, and then to use your judgment to come up with an appropriate solution, which is still ethical, you know, as long as you 
aren't changing the information. Like if somebody has a high school diploma from Cuba and they say, make this look like a bachelor's degree so that I can get this job. Well, that would be um, unethical to, to change that information, even though, um, yeah, period. Yeah. Okay. Parents of spouse to Elena Gomez Prieto. Okay. So most of that information was the same. I'm going to put an extra space here, then go down with testigos de los contraentes. Uh, witnesses for the couple. Contraentes actually means the contracting parties, um, but we don't talk about a marriage contract. We don't use that term in English. And so if you put the contracting parties in the US, the, the bureaucrat who gets that would be like, wait, this is a contract? I thought it was a marriage. We're like, yeah, it's a marriage contract. And they'd be like, but that's not a contract. A contract is only between businesses. So we took contraente and went with a mm, culturally appropriate rendering of the couple. And I feel like a point that, that that's being reiterated here is, like he said earlier, it, it, translation is not a science, it's an art. And this time, in this case, we're going to do it this way. And in another uh, on another day it, with a different doc document, going to a different end user, we might translate the same thing slightly differently. And, and as Marco said, you've got to use your judgment um, and be as accurate as you can. Uh, but it's it's not going to be exactly the same every single time. Javier Sigras Puente. For nombres, I'm going to use first and middle name with, with S in parentheses here. Um, first surname and second surname and nobody who only speaks english knows what a first surname and a second surname is but i don't know any more culturally relevant way to concisely express that yeah you could you could get into the, the weeds and, and discuss that it's the father's first surname and the you know, like you could explain it all but it's probably not prudent estado um don't put state. Estado sometimes means state, but in this case, it means status. Marital status. Marital status, but it doesn't say estado civil. Um, I think if I put status and then married, that would imply marital status. Yes. I think you could, an argument could be made for putting marital in brackets, marital status, and then yep. single, married, divorce, whatever. Yeah. Um, Probably if it, it was blank and it just had estado there, I would put um, marital in brackets. For clarification, sure. Relationship, cuñado or a ah, um, brother or sister-in-law might be a, a simple way to express this, or maybe sister in parentheses, sister-in-law. What do you think? How would you say that? Yeah, yeah. You, well, yeah, brother, sister-in-law. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm just weighing the merits of the parentheses versus the slash. But okay, so I've copied and pasted that block, and then I'm just going to go in and change the names for the second one. The more um, keyboard shortcuts you're you're comfortable with using, the faster these um, forms can be reproduced and in Mexico, rather than retyping the stuff. Yeah, it may be confusing oh if you're God. not because he's he's not showing a whole lot of the page at once. Um, that he's copying, and pasting, and then redoing information, and he's moving really quick, <laughs> but. Um, but he's not just, yeah, he, he's copying, pasting, changing fast. And this is kind of interesting. We have um, domicilio for witness one and then domicilio habitual for witness two. Why? I have no idea. But I'm going to also make sure so the last name. We don't use last name because it's there's a first last name and a second last name. And we feel that that is a more confusing term. Saying first last, first last name. Right. And so in English, yeah, we usually say last name. But it also is your surname is is a common enough term that I think it it, it is clearer to say surname because the surname yeah. is your last name. That is it's yeah it's sort of a, a higher register, more formal way to say last name. But this is a legal document, so we can be a little formal. Um, domicilio habitual. I'm going to put usual address. You could say habitual address, but that's just odd in English. Estado concubinato. Um, there is an old word in English, concubinage, I think, 
but that's like 500 years ago people stopped saying that um yeah. and now a concubine is just sounds like something out of the bible like uh, yeah, king david mistress. had concubines or, or yeah. solomon yeah i'm the mistress of the <laughs> and, no, 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 no. and so i'm gonna call that common law marriage um there are okay. different different ways to express this there's slang ways um that people might use in a casual conversation but we don't want to get into slang in a legal document um que se casaron atrás de la iglesia. Uh, relationship, cuñado, occupation. Okay, uh, that's good. Now we have our third witness. So again, I will copy and paste this, leave a space for readability. And we have here Ignacio. Ignacio, not Joe, right? Yeah, we've been talking about <laughs> nicknames, trying to remember all oh, the nicknames. Well, this one we're gonna ask Meme. Meme, what's it? What's Meme a nickname for? Somebody throw it in the chat. Meme is for Manuel. Oh, oh of course. Of course. Yeah, of course <laughs> it is. Yeah, yeah. Ignacio Ovalle Encino. Okay. Nombre, apellido, segundo apellido, 54. I'll change this. Good. Usual address. No, we've gone back to just domicilio. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why they took out the word habitual. That doesn't make any sense, but whatever. You didn't um, write it. You just status. Uh, I would say married, even though it's a different part of speech from marriage. That feels right to me. Um, parentesco ninguno. No, no. No, so I... relationship. No. I'll space this out a little bit so it lines up better. Relationship, relationship. Yeah, yeah I'm just going to, that, that one doesn't have as much room, so I'm going to move the one above and Oops. below it. And I know if we'd made those pretty tables, it would all be lined or up. Just now. Used, to, used tab. I don't know why you're not tabbing. <laughs> Sorry, I'm under, guy, under huh? a lot of pressure here. You type next time and you see what it's like. <laughs> okay, 54. And then we've got one more witness. There, are there usually four witnesses? I thought it was just two. Often there are four. Maybe it depends on the state. True. Um, so the last one is Micaela. But they don't often give all of this information for witnesses. Often it's just a name and like age and yeah. relationship or something like that. They don't always have all of this. Saragosa. Um, the concubinato, yeah, yeah. live together, yeah. Yeah, and so that is what, what is often referred to as a common law marriage. Once you've lived for a certain amount of time, depending on the state that you live in, um, once you've been living in the same home for a certain amount of time, you are considered by some states to be common law married, and there are then certain um, benefits uh, that apply to you as being common law married. And I see that for the Estado, it says casado o casada. And sometimes the Spanish is gender specific and the English is gender neutral. And sometimes the Spanish is gender neutral and the English is gender specific. And sometimes they're both gender neutral and sometimes they're both gender specific. So you have to look at the, the full context and figure out, do I need to specify the gender in my target language or not? In this case, it's gender neutral and English married can apply to male or female. Nombres de las personas que dan su consentimiento por minoría de edad de los contrayentes. Okay, I'm going to look at my cheat sheet here and see how I usually translate this because we go back and forth. Names of the persons who give consent for bride, groom, not of legal age. Kinship for relationship. That's fine. Kinship is a synonym for relationship. Yeah. Um, I feel like relationship is just more, more common. Kinship is sort of a, an older term. Name of the person. And because sometimes it is not a kin relationship, it's a friend of the family, and that might be included on a document as well. Okay. I guess it depends on the document, though. Like, they may or may not list that it's a friend. They may just put none, and so in that case, it would be a kinship. Yeah. But it's, it's vague. Authorization. Of the, so here we have la Secretaría de Gobernación. ¿Qué es eso? Yo, yo fui a la primera vez que vi eso. Uh, me puse a investigar por Wikipedia y luego por los sitios mexicanos del gobierno para entender qué hace la Secretaría de Gobernación porque no existe en Estados Unidos. There's no Secretariat of Gobernation or something like that. 
hibernation is not a word. And so we looked into it and we figured out the closest equivalent in the US is the Department of the Interior. Um, and that's not really a good translation, but it's okay. And it sort of conveys the same general idea. So. And because it's dealing with conferences and heros, specifically um, foreigners, and so it's the, the Department of State or the Department of the Interior that would be regulating that. And so, again, it, it's the closest equivalent. And I have used Department of State depending on the document, depending on what, what's happening, what's the tramite going on. And then here we have Sociedad Cunidad Marital Property or Common Property or Common Marital Property. This is another aspect of Mexican law that doesn't have an exact parallel in English. And so um, this, it won't really mean anything to the U.S. recipient, however you translate that. But um, a, a similar idea is uh, common property. We share, we share the property that we bring to the marriage. And that becomes important only in the case of divorce which, as I said, is outside the scope of today's mm -hmm. episode. <laughs> Internal Affairs Office for the Mexican Government. Thank you, Mauricio. Um, la presente acta tiene las anotaciones siguientes. This certificate has the following notes or comments or annotations. I'm going to use annotations, which has a single N or double N. I never remember. I always type okay. it and then wait for spell check to... Alexa, spell annotation. Annotation is spelled A N N O. Okay. Thank you, Alexa. Stop. 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 It's nice to have a, a digital assistant next to you it's because when you're typing in capital letters, at least the way I have um, words set up, it doesn't uh, spell check capitals, all caps. This certificate has the following annotations attached. Uh, no. No. Not in this case. So then we come down here to the signatures, um, and it says uno and dos. Um, I'm going to put first and second. Um, what did you call them earlier? What did you call the, um, the spouses? Spouse one, spouse two. Spouse so I would one, call them one and two. two. Consistency. I just boom. Okay, you're the boss, boss. I'm the boss. <laughs> you're the bomb, boss. Okay. Um, I think that's going to be confusing, but whatever. Uh, signatures of spouses. And let me center this a little bit. So I think it makes it more clear because if you're talking about spouse one and spouse two earlier in the document, then having spouse one and spouse two here below. Is the only Back me up, guys. Is the muchacha. Okay, so um, I blurred out the signature, of course, for privacy purposes, but um, I'll just put signature in square brackets. And by convention at our company, we this is the way we indicate things like that. Um, square brackets are nice because they usually don't appear um, in um, elsewhere in the document, so they're not confused with the parentheses. Um, Patricia suggests community property for Sociedad Conyugal. Sounds fine. I will change that. Community property. Or common property is another way to say it. Um, and a comment about signatures. Some people will write out what name they're reading in the signature, and we opt not to do that because I didn't see the person sign it. I don't know who really signed it. I may or may not be able to read the signature. And so putting the signature on there indicates that there's something written there, looks like a signature. But I am not committing to who actually signed the document. It's not like I'm the notary who checked their ID. Right. So um, when you see a table like this, uh, I'm not getting deep into formatting today, but um, what I like to do is, is see how many vertical sections there are. There's three columns, and then how many horizontal. And in some parts, there's only one horizontal row, but in some parts, there's four. So I'll go with the higher number and say this is a four by three table. And then I go back in and merge the cells that are actually joined. So it's ends up looking more like the original. Huella digital contraente uno. Um, spouse one fingerprint. I'll center that. And then in, in square brackets, I'll just note that there is a fingerprint here. And then I'll copy that and paste it over here and put in spouse two fingerprint. And then 
we have the description of the different parties involved. Padres contraentes uno. Spouse. One's parents. Copy and paste. Control E is the shortcut for centering. Spouse two's parents. Um, spouse one's witnesses. Alexa, how do you spell it? No, no, sorry, I wasn't talking to you. Turn off. Um, this might answer your question. <laughs> no. I'm sorry, I'm Alexa, stop. <laughs> Life is so easy since we got Alexa. Quit saying her name. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm muting her there. I pushed the little red button. Uh, I, I bought this thing. She doesn't like it. <laughs> I got one. All, I've got them all over the place. I'm like, ha, ha, ha my minions. Um, okay, now here, this is probably the most complicated part of the whole job, and I hope we have time in the remaining 17 minutes to describe this paragraph because it's such dense legalese, and the syntax is so different from what you would expect in English that I ended up doing a lot of rewriting to come up with uh, an idiomatically natural English rendering. Also, it's a little hard to read. Yeah, I don't know. I hope you guys have the resolution and the bandwidth on your monitors that you're able to make out this text. If not, everyone who signed up for today's class um, on Monday, I'll email you a link to download this whole document that we're working on now so that you can read it up closer. Um, and I put them at the end of my blog. If you go to the text and translation blog, these will be posted down at the bottom as downloads. Um, but it says, Habiendo interrogado a los contrayentes en los términos que la ley ordena y no existiendo impedimento legal y agregó, oh, habiendo. habiendo sido dispensado el ex existente para la celebración del matrimonio, los declaro en nombre de la ley y ante la sociedad unidos en matrimonio y su co contrato matrimonial perfecto y legítimo para todos los efectos legales. Previa lectura del mismo, lo ratifican y firman en unión del suscrito quienes en él intervinieron y saben hacerlo y quienes no imprimen su huella digital. Doy fe. We, we could spend a whole hour just doing this one sentence. That's one sentence, guys. And so um, if you if English is your native language, then you would probably translate this one way. If you're Spanish dominant, you'd probably translate it a different way. But I think the first step is just to understand it. Maybe it, maybe there's some terms in here that you haven't come across before and you'd need to research them and you need to figure out um, what how to say that in the other language. But let's assume you're past that point and then you're trying to figure out how can I concisely and clearly express this in idiomatic American English. Um, I, I would recommend that you start out with a very um, uh, faithful, very, uh, what's the word, um, strict to the original translation and then go through it again and make it flow more naturally in English. And so my, let's say I were uh, called on to interpret in court and they handed this to me and the judge said, read this in English. And so I had to cite translate it. Um, my rendering would be kind of awkward because I'd be sticking close to the English, to the Spanish syntax, and it would sound like this. Having questioned the couple in the terms required by law and there existing no legal impediment or having such been dispensed of, or having dispensed of any such for the uh, performance of this marriage, I declare them in the name of the law and before society joined in matrimony and their mat marriage contract to be complete and legitimate for all legal purposes, period. Having read the same aloud, in Spanish I think it applies read aloud, I'm having, but it doesn't say aloud, so I'll say having read, um, having read it, they sign it, they, they approve it, ratifican, don't say ratify in English, because ratify is just legislators ratifying a law. They approve it and sign it um, together with the undersigned party, el suscrito, um, with the undersigned parties who participated it, in it and know how to do so. And in Spanish, you know, saben hacerlo, Habla de la firma, los que saben escribir su firma. But in, I've never seen an English document that, that mentions anything about knowing how to sign your name. And so 
I would I would uh, expand that a little bit of English to help the reader understand what they're talking about. And so I would say, and those who know how to do so, or maybe in square brackets, if I were writing, I'd say know how to sign, know how to read and write. Um, and those who don't um, affix their fingerprint or leave their fingerprint, period. And then doi fe, we always say I attest, which is awkward and informal in English, but doi fe is kind of um, formal in Spanish too. So that'd be my first pass. If I if I had to do it out loud on the spot, I'd say something like that. But doing it in writing, I have time to sort of workshop it and massage it and put things in different order without uh, adding or subtracting anything. And this is the paragraph I came up with. I'm just going to copy it off of my printout here. I have questioned the couple in the terms established by law and finding no legal impediment to performing their marriage. So you see some different parts of speech coming into play here for idiomatic purposes. Or any such impediment having been resolved, I declare them in the name of the law and before society to be united in marriage. You could say matrimony as a synonym and their marital contract complete. And I couldn't find a way around marital contract here. Um, no, even I think though, that's fine. Because we do understand that, that we don't use the term a lot, but I, I think that's... We understand that it's a, a written document that establishes a relationship. Right, because uh, legal adults have to sign it. All legal purposes, period. After having, after I read this certificate, now does it say, does it imply I, previa lectura del mismo? I think if you were actually there, everybody would listen as the functionary read it out loud. Um, so if I feel comfortable translating it that way, I can say after I read. If you're not comfortable, you could leave it in passive voice and say after it was read aloud, and then you're not um, um, taking a stand on who read it. After I read the certificate, the or having been read aloud, yeah, confirmed it and signed. And then I, I've decided to use parentheses in here to insert the note about los analfabetos, los que no saben firmar. Um, if they knew how to do so, if not, they indicated with a fingerprint. Close parentheses, period, I attest. Okay, so this was uh, my solution to a very challenging paragraph and I'm going to pause for a second and ask if anybody has any any questions or suggestions. We do have a question. Does it matter if you use spouse in the signature part assuming that they're already married whereas contraentes assumes that they're not married? Um, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, because this document makes them spouses, um, they are in the process of spousifying. I just made that verb up. Um, I feel like it's it's a fair translation. It's you're right. You lose a little bit of meaning in coming into the English because there's not an exact equivalent. But I can't figure out a more concise and clear and idiomatic way to say that. And I think the ceremony has to be performed before the document gets signed. And so I think by the time they sign it, they are mm. they have already entered into the contract verbally, and this is a a written documentation yeah. of that. But but Lucia's question brings up a good point. If you were translating a contract for a company that was, say, setting up operations in a U.S. company setting up operations in Mexico, it'd be very important for lawyers on both sides to be involved and to workshop the language to make sure that it carried the, the precise nuances needed so that the contract would be legally valid in a lawsuit in in the the target language. But while this is a contract that we are translating for legal purposes, um, it is, um, they're not hiring a lawyer. And some of you are lawyers. I mean, I'm sure there are people on this call who have a law degree. I'm not. Are you, did you go to law school? No. And so they're, they're hiring us to translate the language and then it's certified that we did it to the best of our abilities. They're not hiring a lawyer to create a new contract which is legally valid in the target legal system. And so there's only so much we can offer based on 
our qualifications. Okay, I don't see any more questions, so I'm going to go on down to the footer here and make it a little smaller so it shows up better. Um, it always jumps back up to the top when you change yeah, the size. Yeah, okay. I'm going to move this up. So now we just have signatures and the stamps and numbers. Um, so this is pretty straightforward. El ciudadano oficial, we know that the C means ciudadano. Um, you would never see that on a document from the U.S. Um, officer number one of the, and it'd probably be like the county clerk here, but um, we tend to stick a little closer to the original and put vital statistics um, office, or you could put vital statistics officer one. Um, that would also be idiomatic. Um, and, and so I've dropped out the, the concept of C altogether because that just doesn't exist in the corresponding legal system. But if you don't, if you don't feel comfortable leaving out the C, then just put in square brackets uh, citizen. Um, not square brackets, but in parentheses because that is found there in the original. Yeah. Um, and I feel like it's, it's thrown in there uh, like they don't. It's not Dr. So-and-so. It's not Licenciado So-and-so. And so they're saying, like, it's just regular Joe, of, um, you know, official number one or officer number one, and and regular that's Joe. and that's fine. Um, but in the U.S., we just don't have an equivalent for that. Either you have the the letters that you're adding behind your name, or you don't. And so it just doesn't. I don't, I don't feel like it's it's required. It's hard to express. But again, if 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 you feel like no, I really feel like we've got to represent that in there. Go for it. Go for it. Because as we've said before, do not. Don't manipulate the document, just write what's there. In Texas, there's no office called the Vital Statistics Office, but I think there are in, in certain states. Maybe in the county clerk's office, there's a person who's in charge of vital statistics as a job title. Right, and, and when you get a like your birth certificate, it does say something about vital statistics records or something like that. Um, it, it, I don't think it says vital statistics on marriage, but again, it, it's it's a matter of two different, totally different legal systems and two totally different offices that are being used. And so you, you kind of have to figure out how to help the target language speaker understand what this document is and where it came from. And so. Here we have it. here we have a the, the number in red on the right um, is vertical and so it's pretty easy to do that in a word table you right click on it and choose um, text direction down here near the bottom and then click on the one that's oriented the same way and it turns it on the side and then while it's still selected I'm going to press Control and the right square bracket several times until it gets bigger so it looks more like the original QR code are those square codes that have a bunch of little dots in them the one that I've blurred out here. And so um, you just have to mention it so that they can see that you've translated everything or indicated everything. Um, here we have a rubber stamp on top of a square that was in the original form. And that's kind of, it's messy to try to make sense of. Um, but uh, seal the vital statistics officer. Okay, the way that I've done it is I've taken the text that was on the paper originally and put it at the top, and then underneath it, I've indicated what the rubber stamp says. And I'll drag this out a little bit so it fits in there better. Um, circular rubber stamp, maybe with, oops, don't you love control Z? Yeah. Interest Life had control Z. With seal of Mexico. I just mentioned that the Aguila. Yeah. Do you want me to put eagle and serpent? It's fine. Seal of okay. Mexico. I like it. Um, so I'm going to turn off the uh, table around here. I'm using the little drop down. There's no right border. There's no top border. There's no bottom border. It's just out in the open. And, then, and for the record, I would never make that number that big. Do you remember me mentioning I would only go to 16 points, and he oh, made that, that 27? Oh. Yeah, I'm just saying, I would never make it quite yeah, that big. I'll go down big. to 24 compromise, right? Yeah. Marriage compromise, that's what it's yeah. about. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, here we have Ciudad Oficial. If you are on previous uh, episodes of this exciting show, you know that we don't use, um, that, that for Licenciado, um, we have come up with the uh, shorthand, not the shorthand, the longhand of saying licensed professional, because we don't really have anything like uh, a licenciado in the United States, but it indicates a professional of some field who has a license from the government and a bachelor's degree or, or an equivalent. Right, and that's the key. It's an it, or an equivalent, and we don't know if it's a BA or a BS or something else, or a BFA or something, or something else that isn't quite equivalent to a bachelor's degree. And so we can't, with any real assurity, say this is the, you know this person has this degree, or they are an attorney, or they do this or know that. We don't know, and so we we leave it intentionally vague because we don't have enough information to be any more specific. Yeah. And then um, down in the bottom, there's a, a number here that I can't read. In the, in the lower left corner, there's a number uh, that's illegible because of the decorative frame around it. So I'm, I can tell it's a number, though. So I'll just put illegible number. And then the word interesado. And I've gone back and forth on inter, interesado. Um, we know that it means this copy was printed up for somebody named in the document who came by the office and paid the fee to get a copy of it, rather than the copy that's kept by the government office. Um, so I've decided, and correct me if you disagree, to say copy for the, in square brackets, and then party concerned um, to carry the idea of interesado. There, some people would understand the interested party in English. That's not a bad translation. Um, but I think the party concern is a little bit clearer, and it 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 has a, um, it's in the legal register. Um, also, he's you can see on the screen there's a couple of blurred out rectangles, and so we're not translating that information just because it's got another name there, but it's just typed in, and I think it's the um, probably the person that prepared the document, and then there's a barcode with a number, and so we've just blurred those out. Um, in the interest of time. It, yeah, and so if, if you could actually see them, you know, we would actually translate them, but it. We're pretending they're not there for the sake of this right. show. And so, <laughs> is that going to stick or are we going to call it the show? <laughs> um, and so then you zoom back out and you look at the document as a whole. Um, if I had translated this, I would go back through and proofread it myself. And then I would send it to a proofreader like maybe Margaret. And she would go through and proofread it too. Because if there's any mistakes, you want to catch them before it gets out to the client. And for sure, before the client sends it to the uh, receiving entity, um, we would... Um, export as a PDF email to the client to check. Once they've approved it, then we would produce the final signed copy and sometimes a hard copy, sometimes a notarized copy, depending on who it was going to. Um, but everybody makes mistakes once in a while, and you just want to try to catch your own mistakes as much as possible to um, avoid inconvenience and embarrassment for everyone involved. So that concludes our translation of marriage certificate. I'm glad we didn't try to do a divorce certificate. I'm so too, glad we only got married today and not divorced because <laughs> I don't have time to get divorced from you today. <laughs> we'll um, continue the series. We're sort of going through the life cycle. We started with birth and then high school, and now we're doing marriage. And, oh, yeah, we did a transcript right in a diploma. Yeah, yeah. and we'll do a university. Um, next Saturday is a university transcript, and then maybe we'll do divorce after that. So the floor is now open to questions. Um, you're welcome, Manuela. I'm glad you are here. Um, so next uh, next Saturday, I hope you'll join us. If you were signed up for today's uh, show, then you're on the mailing list and you'll get a link to, to join us next time. But if you have any questions, we'll be here for the next few minutes and we'd be glad to hear. And what do they do if they have missed one an episode and want to go back and, and watch it? Or, yeah. or, or to... Um, to what do you call them? You watch all the shows at once. Oh, binge! Binge if they want to binge. <laughs> okay. All our that, shows. First of all, I'm sorry if you have nothing to do but but binge our shows. We can recommend some some good stuff on Netflix, but uh, I will put the link to our channel in the chat, and I would love it if you would subscribe to our channel. We're trying to get up to a thousand subscribers. It's and a goal. Yeah. Life, life goal. Yeah, so copy that out of the chat and stick it somewhere where you can get to it. Um, because, of course, once we close the Zoom, the chat disappears and you don't have access to it anymore. Yeah. 
And I'd also like to put in a plug for our charity of the month, which is Austin, no, Asian Family uh, Support Services of Austin. And we are trying to steer donations to them. And so when you get the email, there will be a link. Um, and also in the in the Facebook e event, there's a link. Um, and even if you sent them like five bucks, uh, that would be great because they are, um, like all uh, charities, they are in desperate need of support and they do great work with um, victims of domestic violence all around Central Texas who speak, I think, 29 different languages. And so um, we would love to help them help support that work. Uh, and also, finally, here's a link to our text and translation uh, reviews. And if you want to just get in there and say, text and translation is awesome. I love, I love Marco and Margaret. Um, that'd be I'm cool. I'm so glad they got married. That'd be cool. 